question. And before I hand it off to our chair, I can one that this meeting is being recorded, that we ask that everyone stay muted unless they are speaking in order to keep feedback off of the meeting and allow people to hear everyone. You do have the capability as planning council members and certain staff members to unmute yourselves. Um, we will have a couple of votes during this meeting and they will need to be conducted via roll call. And with that, I hand it off to Paula. Thank you, Abigail. Um, good morning and welcome everyone to our very different kind of meeting. How's everyone doing? I'm not gonna let you answer that. We're gonna keep you muted, um, but I'm gonna assume that everyone's doing okay. So a um, couple of different things that we have to do. And the very first thing is Mark Overlock is going to make a motion because in order for us to proceed with this meeting in any shape, form or fashion, we have to approve the uh, use of the electronic medium. So Mark, would you please go with that? And then I'll need someone to unmute themselves and second for me. Mark? So I'll move that the items on the meeting agenda constitute essential business of this homelessness planning council. Meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans. Considering the COVID-19 outbreak and any rule conflicting with governor's, the governor's executive order 16, permitting electronic meetings is hereby and be suspended. All right, thank you, Mark. I need a second. Second. April. Uh, okay, I heard April and someone else. Second. Okay, so April 2nd. Wendell. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Wendell. Um, so, uh, Judy, would you or Ab or Abigail, would you do the roll call vote, please? Yes. Okay. Okay. Elena Boyer. Okay, folks, so when she calls your name, please unmute yourself and say yay yeah, or nay. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you. April Calvin. Present. Ashley Oswald. Ryan Ellis. Yay. Trina Frierson. Michelle Hall. Yeah. Brian okay, Hassett. Can, hold on, hold on one second, guys. We are actually roll calling for a vote on to proceed with this meeting via um, electronic means. This is not the, or am, I, am I here? This is an actual vote. So you need to vote yes or no. Thanks. This is Michelle Hall, yes. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, between the two of them. Brian Hassett. Um, yes. So, oh, yes. Don Diener. Mark, please mute yourself. Yes. Norman Humber. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine Knowles. Yes. Ingrid McIntyre. Yes. Yes. Mark yes. Overlock. So like the, 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 yes. Okay. So hold on a second. Someone needs to mute themselves or stop talking to someone else. Hey, I'm sorry, this is Abigail Dowell and, and my husband and I are sharing the same office space. So he is I'm on sorry. another call. So if you would gotcha. like somebody else to do this roll call, that's fine with me. I'm sorry, Abigail. That's okay. Keep going. <laughs> Tight quarters around here. <laughs> um, okay, I'm sorry, let me see. Mark Overlock. Will you do the motion? Uh, Mary Catherine Rand. I vote yes. Yes. Beth Shin. I don't believe she's on yet. Sandra Sepulveda. Freddie O'Connell. Aaron Evans. Bob Freeman. Yes. 
Paula Foster. Uh, yes. Laura Bermudez. Yes. Tim Leith. Wendell Seagroves. Yes. Teresa Skiles. Charlie Strobel. Yes, I don't know if, I'm, if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Tom Turner. Okay, I'm showing yeah. that. Hey. Hey, Abigail, there was a couple of people in there that show as panelists, and I think they may have just been muted. You may recall on them just to make yes, sure we know. Yes, I was about to do know. that. Yep, and I can watch and help it as needed. So do that, and I'll help. Thank you. So I noticed that uh, Freddie O'Connell is showing as present, and I did not hear whether he's voted yes or no. Voted yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. thank you. And then the other person is... Tom Turner. Yes. And then I'm seeing a Joanna SKK, and I'm not sure who that is. Abigail, that's, um, that's from the health department. Of oh, thank you. That's Dr. Shaw KK. Hi, hi. Yep, thank you. I believe that's everyone I saw. Kenneth, if you saw anyone else. Oh, I just knew there was a couple there I saw, so I wanted to make sure we had them out. Yes, thank you. All right. So this is the way that this is going to go. <laughs> it's going to be a little awkward, um, but we're going to get through this uh, together. I appreciate the motion and the action item. Abigail or Judy, and I guess um, Derek, would, would, that, would that roll call also suffice as a roll call for attendance? Yes, Judy. Do I need to have her call attendance again? Do we have Derek on here? He Derek says, Smith? looks like he is. Derek, can you unmute and answer that question for us, please? Or not. Okay. I found my unmute button. Thank you. Thank you. Could you rephrase the question specifically? You're asking about... I'm asking, so we, the first thing we've done is the motion to conduct the meeting via electronic means. Um, my question is, normally we then, at the beginning of every meeting, we do a roll call. Does that vote that we just took, would that suffice as a roll call? Or do we actually need to do an actual attendance roll call? Uh, if, if the person maintaining your minutes is able to determine from that vote who is in attendance, they can suspend the requirement of a roll call. That's fine. Abigail, does that work for you? I got it. Okay, thank you. All right. So, <laughs> as we plug along uh, very carefully, please remember if you are not speaking at any particular time, there is, if you move your mouse, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a little microphone button with a slash in it. Please make sure that you are muted so that we don't have background noise going on. And when you're ready to speak, all you have to do is move your mouse again and unmute your button. Um, so. Please mute yourself if you're not currently uh, muted. I'd appreciate that. I've already said welcome to everyone and how a little bit crazy this might be. Um, and we're going to do the best we can to get through this as, as uh, expeditiously as possible. So thanks all of you for your patience. Thanks for being part of this. Um, these are unprecedented times and we're all muddling through as best we can. Um, you'll be happy to know that I have not yet killed my children. Um, so I'm not uh, incarcerated. So that's a probably a positive thing for me at this point. Um, I would like to do, uh, yes, you can all chuckle to yourselves. Um, I'd like to do a moment of silence. And in doing that, I'm going to, uh, again, ask you to make sure you're muted. 
I'm going to read the names of those folks in our community that we have lost uh, since we last met uh, two months ago, uh, and ask you all to remain silent for uh, a minute. The names are Lawrence Preacher Man Oinus, Jerry Wayne Moore, Sandy Torme, Lloyd Case, Terry David Barnes, Joshua Hendricks, Joe Greenwood, Scott Siegel, Charlie Avenger Jr., Laurie Ann Harish, Jessica Hoffman, Ed or E.J. Jenkins, Alexander Verge, Edward E. Kendall, Robert Bobby Jenkins, Sandra Snyder, Eric Walker, and Roger Rice. Does anyone know of anyone else that we've missed? I'm hearing none. Please. Yes. Uh, please. Um, pa yes. Paula, I would like to include Alexander Verge from the Salvation Army. I, I read his name. He's, he's on there. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. All right. Moment of silence, please. And I thank you all very much. So what I would like to do, if it's acceptable, uh, is to go through our agenda and hold all of our questions until uh, the first three things that we need to do are completed. We'll go through the funding update, the shelter update, and the encampment update, and then open it for questions about those things before we move on to the coordinated entry prioritization response, which is an action item. Um, so if you would, we need, who is doing our funding update, Judy? That would be over to Susie and her shop. Okay. Susie? Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Arnie. Hey, this is Susie Tolmey. Yes, I'm I the can. Arnie then. This is Susie Tolmy at MDHA. I'm the homeless coordinator there, and I just wanted to go over the continuum of care funding update. Since the planning council last met, there was a round two announced by HUD, and uh, it restored what we thought was going to be a loss to urban housing solutions of about a quarter of their budget. Um, so we got 172,000 to give them complete funding and then a small grant to the Salvation Army, which was uh, about 59, almost 60,000, reallocated money from an old program um, for them to start something new. Those two uh, in the second round were added to the first round of funding for a total of about 3.925 million. Uh, we got scoring last week from HUD in Washington that gives us an idea about our strengths and weaknesses in terms of our application for 2019. And I'm putting those together in a summary, and we'll hopefully give you some more detail on that at the next planning council meeting. Um, in the phone calls that are going on now more than once a week um, with Washington and the administration of the uh, SNAPS office, which is Special Needs Assistance Program, and that's where the continuum of care funding comes from, as well as the ESG funds. They are not giving us any indication about when the NOFA will be published for the 2020 funds and are paying a great deal of attention to COVID and the transmission instead. Um, there is an exciting opportunity that we're taking advantage of. The Tennessee Housing Development Agency, or THDA, has made available 
$50,000 to each of the continuum of care entities across the state of Tennessee. And uh, they, it is specifically to prevent the transmission of COVID among homeless folks. And we intend in Nashville to apply for the whole 50 to address healthcare issues via a nurse or a nurse practitioner in the encampment and address um, and try and prevent transmission of COVID of people who are sleeping outside. Um, we, there, as you know, there are a variety of HUD funds um, that are um, expanded amounts of funding that we're not used to seeing at all in, um, from a lot of other agencies outside of HUD, but we do have Shelly Fugit who's going to talk briefly about the emergency solutions grants amounts that we expect to Nashville. And I'm gonna pass it over to her. Thanks. Okay, can everyone hear me? I don't know if I've actually dialed in correctly or not. Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, um, so pretty much what I, what I can tell you today is that um, the, for one thing, um, our normal 2020 ESG allocation of around $400,000, look a little over that. We are working to try to get um, the RFA ready for that <clears throat> to go out under its normal process as soon as possible to have um, applications go out for that. Um, and then we received notice that we will be getting about $1,549,000 in ESG CARES funds under the CARES Act. Um, we have been working um, to, um, we did the required um, CARES Act plan um, for those funds that is on our website and some other links. Uh, I think it's actually on the HID website as well. Um, that details kind of a, a general plan for those funds, which includes pretty much our eligible ESG activities of rapid rehousing, shelter operations, um, essential services, um, uh, AMA, HMA, the, the typical um, eligible activities. Um, and again, that document kind of details some of the um, priority needs that um, I think the COC had a survey um, that included uh, some of the needs that we incorporated and then some other folks and other offices have contributed to that. So that's all detailed in that CARES, ESG uh, CARES plan. Um, pretty much our next steps are waiting for more guidance from HUD to um, see when we'll actually get like a grant agreement from HUD because we can't actually move forward with trying to um, do any type of application or anything for those funds until we have like a final agreement from HUD for those funds. Um, hopefully that will come soon. And we are determining uh, in the works, trying to determine the best means for um, determining how we might do an application process for those funds. I do believe there will be a second round of funding um, that will come out. I'm not sure if or how much we would get from the second round of CARES Act funding, but there may be another bucket coming later. And that's pretty much all I have right now. And also just FYI, several of us from MDHA have a mandatory um, um, meeting that we have to attend and they're um, around the uh, 11 o'clock hour today. So we may have to step out early in order to get to that meeting because we are working from home and we have to be able to get there. Hey, this is this is Bob Freeman. Um, quick question on the those funds. You said something about nursing or nurses. What else can we use those funds for? I didn't say anything about nurses. So. Oh, sorry. Somebody else did then. Yeah. Um, sure. what, 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 then what can we use those funds for? Those those can be, those funds can be used for any of your typical ESG eligible activities which include rapid rehousing assistance, prevention assistance, shelter operation assistance, essential services, um, HMIS funding, admin funding, and uh, street outreach is the other one I forgot. Yeah. And there are, you know, things that are included under like operations and essential services um, that are included under those such as case management, um, food, nutrition assistance, transportation assistance, so certain things fall under some of those larger um, titled activities. 
And, and do we have a plan for what we would like to do with it? If you go to that ESG CD uh, plan. Yes, show the hell on just again. Bob, would you? I try to make this um, hopefully as easy as possible. Sure, but sure if you have questions about any of the questions. updates that are happening right now, please. That's okay, Tom. It's okay. No, no, no. Write your questions down because I want to come back to them af after we go through all three of the updates. Um, so make sure you just write your questions down and then we can come back to them. So, uh, Shelly, is there anything else or? No, and, and again, if we have to step out before we get to the questions again, if you just type them up and send them to us, we'll try to get you answers in the next day or two to try to address all those questions. Okay, well, we should be able to get to them uh, way before you need to leave. So um, just sit tight with us for a minute. Okay. okay. Um, shelter update, who's doing that, Judy? Yes, that would be me. Um, so if you pay actually attention to your screen, you should see the PowerPoint changing. Do you see that, the shelter yep. update? Okay. So um, to go quickly through a timeline on uh, March, the mayor signed a safer at home order on March 15. And um, that triggered a lot of, um, you know, people uh, staying at home, which also affected our uh, overall winter shelter program. Uh, Room in the Inn was forced to have their last sheltering day for their congregational uh, program on March 16. They were down to 64 beds. And just to let you know that how, how quickly that happened, their usual minimum is, is around 150 beds. So regularly, Throughout the winter, room and in shelters, um, 150 to 250, and sometimes even more people per night. And um, that um, safer at home just triggered that congregations dropped off. Uh, a lot of the volunteers are elderly. So that really affected our community widely. Um, on March 26, the city government set up a social distancing shelter to offer relief to the local shelter system. And at that point, that really was a national rescue mission. So the national rescue mission uh, served as the main entry point to our local shelter system and um, to relieve uh, that in increments of 50, uh, the, the um, fairgrounds opened up and people from the mission were moved to the fairgrounds in increments of 50 people um, starting on uh, March 26th. And there was usually um, five to seven days in between before the next group of 50 would arrive. The capacity at the fairgrounds is around 250. Um, usually, and especially at the beginning, once, once we had the 200 to 250, it always hovered between that. Um, the shelter was set up uh, based on CDC guidelines, uh, six foot distance between the cots, health screenings twice a day, um, there uh, are two-hour passes for people to go out and, and go to appointments. There, if they have employment, they can go out with an employment pass. Um, it is also a following a safer at home, uh, follow that policy, and uh, try to really get people settled and stay in place. Um, in early April, Metro also, um, a few days later, already set up and was ready um, for COVID positive and PUI sheltering. It is a separate building also at the fairgrounds. It's completely separate from what we call the Welsh shelter. Um, it's closed off. It's also set up uh, based on this um, CDC guidelines. The Metro Health Department advised how to set it up. I think there's 10 by 10 to also 12, 12 by 12 space in each cot. There are separate screens between each patient. Uh, it is staffed, that side is really staffed by um, health um, providers uh, and uh, in full PPE. Um, regardless of that, um, you all have heard that there has been mass testing going on in the shelters. So um, the week uh, prior, right, right before April 29, that week, um, it was discovered that there were four men um, that had been at the mission coming over to the fairgrounds, and that triggered uh, for the health department to step in very quickly and do mass testing at both the fairgrounds and then the day after at uh, Nashville at Nashville Rescue Mission. Um, so, on April 29, 235 people were tested at the fairgrounds and 18 tested positive plus one staff. That was a rate of 8% uh, that tested positive. Um, on April 30, uh, 300 and, 
95 people, including staff, were tested at the man's campus of National Rescue Mission. 100 tested positive, 9 were indeterminate, 12 pending. That was a rate of 28 considered uh, that were 20 percent that were considered positive. Um, it took a few days for these tests to come back, and during that time, it was discouraged to have new admissions. Um, also, I wanted to compare, and I have that on the slide, that uh, Nashville has at their three testing sites, and for when there's testing going on for the general population, uh, about around between 10 and 11 percent test positive, so that you have a comparison with um, the testing at the shelters. Um, I am going, uh, one of the things that I'm going to go and move on to is um, the encampment um, update. I'm going to make that seamless because that's mine as well. So the week of March 16, um, we really looked at how can we actually not forget about encampments. Um, we uh, reached out to our partners. We in, already in January, the Homeless Impact Division had called together um, outreach groups, about nine uh, organizations, to increase outreach collaboration and coordination in encampments. Based on that, we reached out to um, several of the partners and immediately uh, coordinated with them on who's already going out, what is going on, and what are the needs. And the number one need immediately was uh, food. This has been the first time that we have seen in the homeless population that really food has become um, an issue. And so we organized food boxes um, and looked and, and collaborated who's going to which encampments. And so Sally Lott from our team really took up uh, and working and um, working with the nonprofit uh, outreach providers to identify which encampments are out there and need food. And that's her, how we have partnered around that. In addition, um, Metro has set up 14 sanitation stations and placed them close to larger encampments and worked with Open Table to identify uh, where we need to set those up. Um, the week of March 23, um, we quickly uh, created a non um, kind of a, a well, a website for nonprofits and providers. They can update uh, what services they have, what services have changed, what are they doing. Uh, we have some news items on there, and we have some general links to uh, COVID information, um, not just in the city, but also national uh, links that we are watching closely. Uh, the week of March 30th, the food box distribution really took off. Um, I, we also have partnering, just to, to give you an idea, we're working with um, the Salvation Army, Village at Glencliff, Open Table Nashville, the Bridge Ministry, Mental Health Care uh, Cooperative, Shower the People, People Loving Nashville, Second Harvest Food Bank, Shower Up, Vanderbilt Street Psychiatry, and others. I just wanted to give you an idea of um, how many people help. Uh, regularly right now, there are 250 food boxes going out. We're focusing on smaller encampments. There are about six encampments that are um, 20 and plus people. So it's between 20 and 100 people in each of those six uh, encampments. And we find that uh, about 45% of the homeless population is in the larger encampments right now. And that's where really the Salvation Army is stepping in big time, uh, also with some meals programs. Um, there is, and we're going to get to that a little bit later, uh, a lot of coordination and talk about health care in encampments. Neighborhood Health has published a pandemic handbook for outreach workers, and it is actually published at the National Health Care for the Homeless Council so that nationwide people can access it. I think it was uh, the first of its kind. So uh, big shout out to Neighborhood Health for leading that and uh, including us uh, partners in, in contributing to it. Um, we also did a local webinar encampments for um, service providers. There have been going uh, calls going on between uh, service providers to coordinate efforts. Um, the Salvation Army has been activated by Tima. April Colvin is on the call. I will, um, if she wants to say after I'm done a few words and, and uh, explain what their role is, I would, I would love to hear from her. Uh, so April, if you're going to get ready for that. 
Um, in addition, we are using outreach coordination to educate people in encampments as much as possible about COVID. There are encampment cards um, that also with information from neighborhood health on how people can um, get their COVID questions answered, uh, has phone numbers to neighborhood health uh, for a, a nurse um, and, and health officials to answer their questions. And it also has information of men from the mental health co-op and how to access their services on there. Um, the goal really of this coordination is to deliver basic needs and coordinate uh, a lot of traffic in and out of encampments per se. Um, April, if you want to add something on the Salvation Army role. Actually, um, wait, Judy, can we, wait, uh, April, hold on a second. So here's, and again, this is this is one of those places where please indulge me um, as your chair, because I, I, I really want to get through a lot of things because I, I have a very strong feeling that there's going to be a lot of discussion and questions and things. And I want to make sure that we get through what we have to get through so that we can have that robust discussion without any other uh, interruptions. So, Judy, if you're, are you are you done with your? I have one more. Um, so one of the things uh, we have. Can you hear me? You should be able to hear me. Yes. Okay. yes. So I have uh, one more slide uh, because one of the things that we have been working with is a partnership with Community Care Fellowship to create a, a demonstration project around hotel vouchers. Uh, the first foundation has donated forty thousand uh, dollars to house this. 15 to 20 of the most vulnerable people in encamp take them out of encampments, get them into motels. Uh, the referral is happening through coordinated entry, and um, we're going to get into uh, that as an action item, talking a little bit more about uh, the prioritization tool, uh, uh, how we need to update that to, uh, to adjust uh, for COVID. Um, Bloomberg Associates is going to help us their evaluation, and I have for anybody here who's listening, I do have uh, a budget template and other information available if they are interested in a motel voucher program on how to do that and what we can uh, find out through this project. And that's that's it for me. Okay, so will you go back to April's slide, and now April, would you um, give your little portion of that, and then I'm going to move from there. Hello, everyone. This is April Callen from the Salvation Army. Um, I hope you can hear me. Seems like I'm unmuted. Um, so most of you all are aware that the Salvation Army is a disaster relief organization. Typically, when there's a disaster, they deploy officers from one location to meet the needs across the nation um, at that disaster. Well, when it's a pandemic, there's a disaster everywhere. So there's not a whole team of officers that are coming here to help us because they are, in fact, helping their own city and state at this point in time. So um, Major Ethan Frizzell is the point of contact for the disaster pandemic that we're dealing with here in Nashville. He was deployed to work directly with OEM and TEMA um, to help in um, resolving this. Well, not resolving it because we can't resolve it, but um, to help in this situation. Um, so, you all may have seen emails from Jesse Call. Um, Jesse Call was um, helping to relate public will so that it wouldn't look like the Salvation Army came up with all of these ideas and pushed it up to OEM and pushed it up to FEMA or FEMA without the coordination of the wishes of the city. So, those emails were all um, the, the, in, the questions that he was asking were all aggregated together and sent to OEM or sent to Judy who's working along with helping send things up to OEM and or directly to TEMA to help get things like sanitizing stations, to help secure uh, public restrooms or portable restrooms or um, encouraging showering opportunities and a pandemic that's so contagious. Of course, you know, hygiene, 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 instead of location, location, location. Um, also, um, so the Salvation Army have kind of moved through that still working through that process. We're working with the health department, we're working with the neighborhood health on providing um, safety, education. Um, one of the main things we did initially was to go down there to help spread the tents out. 
Um, what we realized was like at the Jefferson Street encampment, a lot of those tents are actually used for storage. You know, that is their home. They sleep in one tent and they store. Can you hear me? So, um, got you now. thank you. Sorry. Um, so in throughout that process, um, and providing education safety, um, what we're realizing is mental health is diminishing. Um, the level of desperation is increasing because naturally, um, those encampments don't necessarily run by themselves. There's a whole host of outreach teams. There's other buildings and locations that typically allow for phone charging or iPad charging so that they can communicate. So um, what, and as you also would know, the number of volunteers that are signing up to help in a pandemic is at an all time low. Um, also what we realize we're competing with is um, in, in trying to help build a flex team that would actually go into these encampments. Um, Tiffany Ladd has been instrumental in providing over 200 meals per day, hot meals, 200 hot meals per day, typically between noon and three o'clock um, to two to three different encampments per day. Um, we know she needs some assistance. Volunteers are at an all-time low. We've posted some positions. You may see that on um, CNM or Indeed to help with doing a short-term amount of flex teams that could help with hospitality, help with HMIS data entry, you know, help with um, moving forward with the plan to get them outside of those encampments and into, as Judy was talking about, some of the hotel vouchers. Um, the main thing is we want to make sure we have a plan on the other side of this pandemic. It's nothing like putting people in a hotel for three months and then when this is all over or when we have relaxed more, moving them back to under the bridge. So we want to make sure we have an end plan with some rapid rehousing dollars on the other side of that hotel voucher stay. So those are some things that we're working on over here. Some of you all probably have been called um, to work with Major Frizzell on this statewide task force. A lot of this started about six months ago. He went to present in D.C. and um, someone from the governor's office here liked what he was presenting on the state of homelessness across the United States. They asked him to form a task force. If you're working on that, if you're um, speaking into that work, I commend you. Thank you so much. Um, seems like it was really expedited um, quickly because of the pandemic. Um, so a lot of that was in place um, before the tornado. After the tornado and the pandemic, the multiple disasters here, that work has taken off um, really, really fast. So um, just know that that statewide task force also has to speak into um, things for some of the smaller counties, all of the counties in the state. So, you know, take from it what you will for, Na for Nashville. It would um, be very unfortunate for the other state, other counties to take off in Nashville to um, be kind of behind. So when we're sending things up through OEM and TEMA, it's things that we've already seen other locations submit and maybe they were awarded or maybe they were not, but we, you know, we have to at least ask. So I think that's it for me. Thank you all for your time. All right, April, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, and again, please all bear with us with the technical issues and the, the audio cutting in and out. Uh, we'll make sure that we get questions answered as we need uh, to do that. Um, right now, I, there's also uh, something that there is, is Brian Hale from Neighborhood Health on the call? And if so, can we unmute him? Brian from Neighborhood Health has, uh, is gonna give us some information about what Neighborhood Health is doing with uh, some rapid testing in the encampments. Uh, that I thought would be very beneficial for us to know uh, going into a more of a discussion. If you if you have questions, there's a little function on the right side down at the bottom. There's a little hand that waves. You know, put your hand up. We will try to get to folks in the order that I see those hands pop up, if possible, um, when we start taking questions, which will be in just a few minutes. But uh, Abigail, is is Brian with us and able to talk to us? He is on, Kenneth. That is who I sent you the phone number earlier. I believe on my list, he's the attending number 19. If you can unmute him. He All right, this is Brian Hale. This is Wendell. Uh, I'm on my phone because my laptop's down. I don't have that little hand feature. 
That's okay, Wendell. At any point in time that you feel like you want to say something, just chime in and we'll get you in, okay? Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. Okay. This is Brian Hale from Neighborhood Health. And I, I had shared with members of the council that for whom I had the email addresses, just a couple of, of quick remarks. And I, I want to hit the highlights of this really quickly. The sense is that um, it's important to remind everybody that medical care is very much available. And we talk about how we do that at Neighborhood Health at five locations across the city, even in the context of the pandemic. At the same time, what we're trying to make sure that we emphasize is that COVID-19 is far from our only threat. And what we're chiefly worried about at this point is diabetes and blood pressure along with the pandemic. So how do we manage both in the context of a lot of constraints imposed by infectious disease? And that infectious disease is gonna be kind of even more pressing as we move into the fall where we need to be doing a lot more um, flu shots. I think we've been reviewing the data from Australia, which is they're going through winter and entering their flu season right now. And the flu shot utilization there has been all over the map. And so that's gonna be increasingly important that we get in front of that uh, this fall here and it, so that we avoid a, a twofold pandemic. With all of that said, I think the, the points that have been emphasized here are that as we continue to decongest shelters, people are migrating into encampments. You've seen that, we've seen that. And how are we working to make sure those individuals have access to healthcare, medications that they need, and then ultimately, as Paula mentioned, the rapid testing. We've asked uh, Major Frizzell and the Office of Emergency Management to secure rapid testing kits as well as lab processing. And we're putting together a team that will go into encampment to provide ongoing rapid testing with some level of frequency so that we can identify individuals who may be asymptomatic and ensure that they isolate in a way that protects other people in those encampments against uh, contagion. One of the things that we're learning, thanks to the very diligent work of Cheryl Fleisch, Dr. Cheryl Fleisch, is that in the, the shelters and encampments across the country when they're being tested are seeing asymptomatic rates of about 50%. And we'll see if that's sustained, but at least initially it's consistent with some of the early results that we saw in shelters doing the testing here. Testing too is not confined just to individuals who are living in encampments. It also includes outreach workers and shelter staff we offer ongoing precautionary testing and we can test as often as your, as your staff might need that. Do reach out to me if you'd like to get your, your staff set up on, a, on an ongoing uh, precautionary testing schedule. Happy to do that and we think that may make sense if they have exposures. It also is important too with those exposures um, that they're maintaining as much social distance and, uh, and trying to do as much infection control prevention as they can. And with that, we published, as Judy mentioned, the pandemic outreach, the pandemic handbook for outreach workers visiting encampments. I sent a link to you that you have that in, your, uh, in the document that I had emailed to you. And I know that Judy will be forwarding that out. Likewise, if your staff would like, um, would like not only testing or, or just really some basic instruction and infection control so that we go through the content of the handbook and really try to work to apply it in real world situations, we're more than happy to do that. Our own outreach workers are getting a little bit more practice with this and we're delighted to help you with that as well. The, the other two key uh, things that I'll mention are we wanna advocate very, very loudly for more housing without shared spaces. I, I don't wanna get into the discussion or debate about what's congregate or non-congregate. The bottom line is that if homeless individuals share bathrooms, dining spaces, or other communal areas, they're at much higher risk for, uh, uh, for, for transmission of the virus. And so what we're recommending is that um, consistent with some of the, uh, some of the uh, policies that Major Frizzell has advocated for, that individuals at uh, age 55 and older and those who are medically fragile have access to, uh, to shelter options or housing options that don't involve these shared spaces and these risks of infection. So we're really excited about our work together. It's gonna be a slog. It's been a tough, tough eight weeks. Um, but I think w leaning on your strength has been such a sustenance for us, and we hope that you feel that you can do the same. We're going to be in encampments. We're going to be providing this medical care. We're going to be delivering medications. And um, with the help of Major Frizzell and OEM, as soon as we get those rapid testing kits, we'll be doing ongoing rapid testing. That's what Nashville needs, and that's what we're here to provide. Thank you. Brian, thank you very, very much for joining us today and for giving us that information. And I want to say, I know personally, I really very much appreciate what Neighborhood Health is doing um, for our folks out there. And and we want to support you in any way that we can. So here's what I'm, I want to do. I know that there's a lot of questions.
because there is one action item that we need to do. I'm gonna ask Judy to go over the coordinated entry prioritization response as quickly as she can so that we can go ahead and get that out of the way so that we can have the remaining time that we have together um, to talk about what we as a council need to do going forward. So Judy, would you take care of that real quickly? And then we will come back to uh, all our questions and comments that we all feel like we need to make around everything that's been happening. Paula, uh, you have been breaking up and I hope it's only uh, on my end, but um, so I understand that we're going to the coordinated entry prioritization response um, action item and I'm gonna hand that over to Sally uh, Lott from my team to go through that. Okay, Sally, would you do me a favor and do it as quickly, as quickly and succinctly as you can? I will talk quickly. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Hello everyone, I am Sally Lott. I'm the Coordinated Entry Manager at the Homeless Impact Division. Um, Judy, were you gonna pass the presentation ball so I can um, share the handout on my screen? If not, I can just talk through it. Yes, I can do that if y'all need me to. This is Ken, the host. Okay, I was just gonna um, have that pulled up if need be. Yes, Kenneth, if you could pass it to Sally Lott, that'd be great. Okay, great. I see it. Um, okay. Um, so basically what I have here um, is the coordinated entry prioritization change proposal. Um, as you all know, coordinated entry is meant to grow and change as your community's needs grow and change. and but it's being very clear right now that it is the time for coordinated entry to pivot. Um, it needs to be able to target those who are most vulnerable, like it always does, but also now target those who are most at risk during this pandemic. As more resources come in to Nashville, uh, we need to show that these resources are going to be allocated well and prioritized to those who are most vulnerable to COVID-19 health complications. So because of that, we are um, proposing this prioritization change. And these changes are based on knowledge that we've gotten from other communities and from CDC guidance. So our previous prioritization score, what we're using now, is the ISPADAT score plus length of time experiencing homelessness as a tiebreaker. What our proposed updates to this prioritization are will be to still use the ISPADAT score as a base add one point for unsheltered homelessness, one point for being 55 or older, and one point for CDC identified uh, pre-existing health conditions. So that would be up to an additional three points on any score, and then still using length of time experiencing homelessness. Um, we brought these uh, changes to a stakeholder group that is currently active um, in coordinated entry in this community um, and had brought up some of their, um, for them to present kind of questions and concerns. Um, these I'm pulling over here. Um, one was um, a potential self-reporting flaw. What if someone has not disclosed health conditions in the VI SPDAT or an HMIS? And that is going to be addressed. How navigators will be able to communicate any health conditions that weren't originally reported with CE um, or weren't originally reported in the VI SPDAT or an HMIS with CE staff. Um, someone, it was asked about family consideration. Will they be given any extra prioritization? And the way the family VI SPDAT is set up is that it considers the entire family unit. So any family member, including children, will be considered for the health prioritization point, and the family VI SPDAT also has a greater number of total base points. Um, about question about COVID diagnoses, will those with a positive COVID-19 diagnosis be prioritized? Um, and the purpose of this new prioritization is going to continue to be for everyone with high vulnerability, and that these changes will prioritize individuals and families most at risk of serious complications due to COVID-19. And then it was asked, will these new prioritizations succeed in accelerating those at high at risk to the top of lists? And 
basically we're going to be monitoring that and to see if these changes are going to have the intended outcomes. Um, back to implementation, these changes are going to be implemented immediately for all resources currently available through coordinated entry and hopefully any new resources that are coming in. Programs, as always, will still be in control over their own eligibility criteria. This is something that currently happens in coordinated entry. These prioritizations will work within criteria. Um, and then our CE team will be working closely with different agencies in the community to explain this new prioritization process um, and what all um, they need to do. Uh, in terms of evaluation, um, during the pandemic, we will be moder monitoring the new prioritization closely and we're going to provide reports to the stakeholder group for reviewing that it is effective and that it is ensuring that those most vulnerable to COVID-19 complications are being housed most quickly and resources are being made available. Um, HUD has suggested that there be a time frame of 10 days to adjust any CE prioritizations, which is quick. Um, and so we are going to be working with the stakeholder group to determine and implement any necessary adjustments to um, to be within that potential 10-day time frame. All, any prioritization changes or adjustments will be, of course, communicated with the Homelessness Planning Council immediately via email, and then also be brought up for questions and discussions in future meetings, whether they be in person or virtual. So that was a very quick, hopefully, summary of our pro proposal for CE prioritization changes. All right, thank you, Sally. I need a motion to adopt the coordinated entry prioritization change proposal. So moved. That was free. I, Bob, I second it. Bob. Second. Bob and second by Wendell. All right, are, is there any discussion or questions about this particular uh, motion at this, at this time? All right. And hearing none. Um, hey, Paula. Hey, Paula. Yes. This is Ingrid. I'm really sorry to interrupt, but I just am noticing, I'm just noticing that there's some hands that are raised, and I don't know if those are questions to this. Those are, those are we're going to get back. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. This particular thing. Elena, I see your hand went up. Unmute yourself. Hi, yes, I didn't want to um, take any time. It's just more of a note, um, and I think people are aware of this, but just have a, a, a note in the minutes that the VI sit at doesn't really um, look at degree of condition. So if somebody checks the box if they have a type of cancer, you don't know if that's stage one or stage four. So just making sure that when we're talking about it, we know the limitations of the tool. Um, there's also been evidence to suggest that there's a lot of racial issues with the tool too. So didn't mean to open up for discussion, just wanted to make that note of the limitations. Obviously um, it's an adopted tool. So just wanted to put that out there. That's it. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And I think that is a very valid point. Um, one to which we cannot really address today via this particular medium, but we will make sure that we are aware and come back to that in the future as we move forward. Thank you, Elena. Um, so Kenneth, once someone has raised their hand and spoken, is there a way to turn off their hands so that I... Uh, that user would have to click the raise hand button again to actually lower the hand. I don't think I have to come back to them. Um, don't know how that works. What? Wendell's raising his hand. Ah, perfect, thank you. All right, I've right. just got a comment about the feeding. I just want everybody to know that since the tornado, my group, Sanctuary Homeless Refuge, hey. has been going down. Well, Hello? Yeah, can, can, you, can you hold that particular comment um, until after we make this vote? Oh, okay, sure, yeah. No problem, thank you, I'll come back to you. Um, all right, will you, Abigail or Judy or whomever, please do a roll call vote for this motion? A motion to approve the coordinated entry prioritization change proposal. Yes. Elena Boyer? Yay. April Calvin? Yes. Bob Freeman? 
Yes. Brian Hassett? Yes. Catherine Knowles? Yes. Charlie Strobel? Yes. Don Diener? Yes. Aaron Evans? Yes. yes. Freddie O'Connell? Yes. Ingrid McIntyre? Yes. Laura Bermudez? Yes. Mark Overlock? Yes. Mary Catherine Rand? Yes. Michelle Hall? Yes. Paula Foster? Yes. Ryan Ellis? Yes. Sandra Sepulveda? And Tom Turner? Yes. Thank you. You forgot Wendell. Oh, I'm sorry, Wendell. <laughs> You're all the way at the bottom. Wendell Seagroves. That's, that's easy to happen, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, motion um, is approved. All right, so. We have about 30 minutes left of our official meeting. I think we can run over a little bit if we need to, if folks are still available and our discussion goes that long. So let me start the next um, piece, which is our recommendations for next steps with um, a couple of things. I know that we're having a little audio trouble and we're cutting out a little bit. So hopefully um, we'll get it all in. So first I want to say that um, I, I feel like we should have been meeting um, regularly, and we have not. Uh, that was a recommendation from uh, somewhere that unless there was something that needed to happen specifically that we didn't meet because of the extraordinary circumstances, I feel like that was a mistake on my part as your chair. So I apologize for that. Um, what I want to do now, and I think we all have quite a few things to say, um, I know that I have a few things to say with words that probably shouldn't be used in a recorded uh, line. So I will start with saying that I am incredibly disappointed uh, and dismayed by the fact that our city uh, administration has failed to seek this council's input into its um, planning for our neighbors who are experiencing uh, life without homes. And I don't know exactly where we can go from here, but I have some ideas. And I know that many of you share that feeling uh, even more strongly than mine. So I want to open it up for some discussion about what's going on. You know, I've, I've been incredibly dismayed by the conditions at the fairgrounds um, and concerned. And I'm also incredibly concerned that um, someone from the fairgrounds who wanted to leave their shelter was arrested. Uh, and charged with a felony for escaping a penal institution, which is the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard, and I'm incredibly uh, incensed by that. So with that, I'm going to open the floor. To hopefully figuring out a way to move forward. I'm going to start with Dawn Diener. She had her hand up first, and then we're going to go to Freddie, um, and we'll take it from there. If you. If you were on the line, I, on, on. line and cam between folks, if you can, and we'll try to get to you. So, Don, would you like to would you like to speak? Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to be brief because uh, I know that there are probably a lot of other people who have things to say. Um, and I'll confess, I have enough questions. Um, that I could take another hour probably asking questions and trying to get answers. And I guess that's why my first suggestion is going to be that we need to have another meeting soon. Um, but, and I'm sure that means a specially called meeting of some sort, but I think we need to have another meeting soon where we can get answers related particularly to, to shelter and what's happening at the fairground. Um, the questions that I have relate to um, who, who made the decisions ultimately that this is the route that Metro would go in terms of setting up congregate shelters out at the fairground. 
Um, I have questions about whether the testing that is happening both at the fairgrounds and at the rescue mission was voluntary testing, uh, what the terms of that voluntary testing were. In other words, if somebody declined to be tested for COVID, but first of all, could they decline? And if they decline, uh, what was the consequence of declining to be tested? I would also like to know um, whether or not we believe the policies that this city is implementing related to testing, particularly of individuals experiencing homelessness, encourage them to participate in testing or discourage people in testing. Um, what I have seen unfold in really just the media um, would suggest that our policies right now are discouraging people from being tested who are experiencing homelessness, discourage people from taking advantage of shelter care, um, and are treating individuals experiencing homelessness significantly differently than people who have homes. Uh, so I just have a whole lot of questions about how in the world uh, things are being operated particularly at the fairground. Um, and I don't, I, I want answers to those questions and don't want to take up everybody's time at this meeting to get them. So I'm asking for a separate meeting as soon as possible uh, where we can ask questions and get answers from the people who can. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, you, you were cutting out there at the end a little bit. So uh, were there any, you, I think I got most of your questions. Um, is there anything else that you needed to say there? No, just that I would like to have another meeting as soon as possible. Okay. Freddie? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank everyone who has dug in deep during the crisis. This is the hardest thing most of us have ever done, I know. Um, living through it and attempting to govern through it certainly are the hardest things I have ever done. I mean, this is, I think it's important to acknowledge that. And I know Judy, Susie, Christine, and so many of the providers who sit at this table have all been working hard to connect to our public health response in ways that are meaningful to the community that we support. And some of what I'm going to say echoes Paula. We are a planning council. As far as I can tell, there has been nothing about our local response to COVID-19 from a public health standpoint that has engaged this governance body to participate in any planning. Uh, you know, Dawn noted our last meeting was canceled. Paula noted this too, just as the COVID-19 outburst taking hold in Nashville and our committees sit largely idle. We've already seen the drawbacks of this body's guidance being ignored during the weather and it seems apparent at least to me that we're going to have to fight to ensure that our public health response recognizes that the crisis hits especially hard among people experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness uh you know the fairgrounds shelter process has been entirely managed by oem with no guidance from the hpd or any of our committees we have departed from best practices and guidance from federal and state agencies as well as national advocates and providers and there have been few explanations as to why. So far, we've only announced CARES Act funding to cover hazard pay for Metro employees. We have $120 million available from the CARES Act that must be spent in the short term on COVID-19 expenses. And this council should help make it imperative that we use some portion of that funding to better protect our most vulnerable Nashvilleians. I think it is high time for the council to be in the game and my personal recommendations, I'd like to encourage uh, the planning council to support our chair in putting forward a letter with some very specific recommendations to the mayor's office and Metro Public Health Department that leverages our expertise. We, this is a group of people who know the community as well as anybody who understand the academic research as well as anybody and who track national best practices uh, and what other communities in Tennessee are doing as well as anybody. And the, this table should have some impact on what we're doing. And I'll say, as a member of Metro Council, I'm frustrated. We've instructed to submit any questions about COVID-19 to the council office, and we get answers once a week if we're lucky. There's no room for understanding, like asking follow-up questions easily. I mean, a follow-up 
follow-up question can take as long as two weeks to get more detail. Um, so I do have some specific questions about our homeless approach, including some of the things that Dawn just asked, but I think one of our most imperative actions today needs to be to put to, to Dawn's point, I think, probably prepare our committees, maybe have an ad hoc committee or something to put forward some guidance, just so it's clear. Yes. Freddie, you, you anyway, have- There's more we could be oh. doing as a community, but I'd be happy to work on that letter. Okay, so you, the, Freddie, you, you, I swear to God, you have read my mind, uh, and that's a little scary, because uh, that's exactly the direction that I wanted uh, to go, and you know, that's, that's very interesting. It's, like I said, a little scary. Um, Ingrid, you wanna, you wanna add something to that? Too. <laughs> <laughs> Ingrid, do you wanna add something to that now? Well, I just didn't know if it was appropriate to make a motion. Um, I think there should probably be two, one about the letter and one about a, a pretty immediate meeting, I think. Yes, let's take those separately. Um, so would, Freddie, would, I, you kind of brought this up. Would you like to move uh, that the Planning Council craft a letter uh, with recommendations and concerns and recommendations to our uh, administration around our response and planning. Yeah, let's let's maybe do it this way to Ingrid's point is, how about this? How about I would like to move that we create a, a COVID-19 response committee that drafts a letter uh, for the council and that we maybe separately to, to cover Dawn's guidance. Um, also that I would move that we have a special called meeting of the council to basically deliberate over those recommendations. Second that motion. Thank you. Can I just, have a, I just have a question about oh, this motion? So the motion was to create a COVID-19 response. Yes. Uh, yes. My question, or I just would like to make an addendum that we, um, trust and uh, follow Paula as our chairperson and leader to create that. Totally, totally on board with that. I would, I would encourage the chair to, to recommend people for that committee. I'm fine with that. Okay, thank you very much. Do I have a second? April 2nd. April 2nd. Um, Abigail, will you do a roll call vote, please? This is the motion to create a COVID-19 response, I'm gonna call it a task force, to uh, make, to express our concerns and make recommendations regarding the city's response to COVID-19 for our citizens experiencing uh, life without homes. Okay, and I just wanna be clear that there are, based on what I just heard, that sounds like there are two motions on the table, or is this no, all in one to have no, I a think special call meeting and the response? No. Nope, yes, no, correct. just the response task There's, force. Response. Yeah, so we'll do okay. another one as the, yep. The, the yep, next okay. one is to get a meeting. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I read this back to make sure I have that right? Yes. Um, so, um, Freddie moves that we create a COVID-19 response task force to express concerns and create recommendations to the administration regarding um, the response to COVID-19 and people experiencing homelessness. Can I say something? Yes, Charlie. Yeah. Oh, we got a lot of feedback. Hold on. Charlie Charlie has the floor. Well, I'm not clear as to whether we need one or two. Does the membership of this group come from the, the meeting that we're about to have, or is that being, are they being appointed uh, separately? I think Se for... Go ahead. Paul. So the, mem the members of the task force, should you all approve this motion, um, will be appointed by me. And I think we need to broaden that authority. Of um, I will ask for some volunteers. Say that again. Well, it seems to me if we're going to form a group. What's that? It seems. Go ahead, Charlie. It seems to me if we're going to form a group, that group would have a, a wide uh, perspective on who should be on it. And I like to think that that's the way we ought to do it. Unless okay. the urgency of this is such that, Paula, you need to go ahead and let's do that. I mean, Charlie, I do think there's some urgency. If you want to be 
Um, I mean, I'd be happy to amend the motion such that you and Paula have some um, authority to point folks. I just, you know, I, I want to move with some speed here too. Well, I appreciate the offer, but I, I, I'm, I'm happy with Paula doing it. But I, I, I'll surely give my opinion. <laughs> okay, um, Ingrid, I think you had your hand up again. Oh no, I was just going to make a response. Sorry, it's been answered. Okay. All right. Is there any any other discussion that we need to have at this time, or can we go on to the vote? All right. Who, so Freddie made the motion, and who seconded that? Wendell. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's take. All right. And also, just a reminder to everyone that these all these votes will need to be ratified the first time that we meet in person. Okay. Elena Boyer. Yes. April Calvin. Yes. Brian Hassett. Yes. Catherine Knowles. Yes. Charlie Strobel. Yes. Don Diener. Yes. Aaron Evans. Yes. Freddie O'Connell. Yes. Ingrid McIntyre. Yes. Laura Bermudez. Yes. Mark Oberlock. Yes. Mary Catherine Rand. Yes. Michelle Hall. Yes. Paula Foster. Yes. Brian Ellis. Yes. Sandra Sepulveda. Yes. Tom Turner. All right, you're still showing up. So, Tom, I'm going to come back to you in just a second. Wendell Seagroves? Yes. And Tom Turner? One more time, Tom. Are we still waiting for Tom? Yes, I, I mean, I, I could not hear him if he said anything. Looks like he's unmuted himself, but I can't hear him either. We're, we're gonna have to go on then. I'm sorry, Tom, Yeah, can't hear your vote. Uh, but the motion passes. Uh, and Paula, may I interrupt and just say that one of the reasons for please. bringing it, excuse Point. me. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead, Charlie. Am I on? Yes, go ahead. I, I just wanted to make sure that we have a representation from the homeless or formerly homeless folks on this group. Oh, that's always a always a good point. Thank you. Um, so I, with that, and because I too, Freddie, think that this is something that is uh, urgent and essential, I want to go ahead and see if we can appoint this committee now, so, and that way we can go ahead and, and get started. So here are my thoughts. Uh, please say yes or no when I uh, when I ask. Ingrid McIntyre, would you serve on this task force? Um, yes, thank you. Dawn Diener? Yes, thank you. Um, Elena Boyer? Yes, thank you. Ready? Yes, I set myself up for that. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, you did. Uh, Wendell, would you? Happy to. Mark Overlock, would you? Yes. And Charlie, would you be interested in being on this task force as well? I think um, Rachel Hester would be a good representation from 
room in the so I Do you want members from this group? Planning Council members? Yes, members from this group. I, I, I would be happy to serve. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I would also, because I know uh, Beth Shen has done some, some research and things around uh, appropriate uh, guidelines around congregate living and things, I, I'm going to reach out to her. She's not on the call at this moment. I'm going to reach out to see if Beth would also uh, serve on this committee. Uh, and all right. Thank you very much. We have a few more moments. Um, Freddie, would you like to go again? I know you uh, said something about a letter. Did, did you want to include as part of the first thing that we do is craft a letter to the administration? Is that the, is that the, that's the purpose of this task group? Yeah, the, uh, what I think, I think the best path forward here is to connect these pieces, right? So this task force will come up with recommendations to be put in letter form um, that we would then recommend to the full council, right? Unless the council wants us to give us authority to, you know, do it independently. But I think it's better if the letter actually has the blessing of the full council. And so that is why I would like to make a second motion uh, that we reconvene the council um, to Dawn's point uh, in the in the near future, right? As soon as practically possible. Lost you again. Okay. Okay. Do I have a second for that motion? Second that. Wendell again. <laughs> there we go. So this, this motion is to reconvene the Planning Council very soon, uh, and that will be a piece of, we have to consider Sunshine uh, rules as well as uh, IT and making sure that that can happen. Um, but as We're going to do the same thing for our task force. Uh, I imagine when we meet, right. you will need to notice that, and then we will need to notice a, a council meeting subsequent to that. Correct. Uh, we'll have to do both of those things for as soon as uh, is humanly possible at this point. Uh, any discussion around uh, calling a special meeting? I have a question. Uh, is there a way, because this is a pandemic and it's pretty serious and people are dying every day, that we don't have to have like a two week, is it a one week or two week announcement period? It's one week. Yeah, that seems like a long time to me. Legal? So my understanding, and let me, let me ask you that, and I... Places, but... Doesn't the sunshine rules don't they don't they say that we're supposed to give reasonable uh, notice, or is there a hard Derek? and fast rule that says we have to give a week? Eric, Eric Smith, are you on? Eric doesn't really seem to be listening to us. Hello. There this is, is Mark. Uh, I work with Derek for the hospital authority. It is no, the seven day rule is from Metro Legal as a recommendation. So as long as we, he said to me several times, you know, as long as you get out some sort of reasonable notice, you now 48 hours is not reasonable. So it's going to be something longer. And I appreciate Ingrid's urgency and everybody else. So, okay. Just so, Derek, see, Derek, I see you unmuted yourself. still not hearing Derek. Okay. So my thought at this point is that we will we will work with, with Metro Legal and, and our team to do something that is as as expeditious as possible, um, taking into account all the necessary legal implications of that as well. Um, all right, so we need a we need a vote on whether or not to call that special meeting. Okay, yeah. I'll start the roll call. Elena Boyer? Yeah. April Calvin? Yes. Catherine Knowles? Yes. Charlie Strobel? Yes. Don Diener? Yes. Aaron Evans? Yes. Freddie O'Connell? Yes. Ingrid McIntyre? Yes. 
Laura Bermudez? Yes. Mark Overlock? Yes. Mary Catherine Rand? Yes. Michelle Hall? Yes. Paula Foster? <laughs> Paula Foster? Yes. Ryan Ellis? Yes. Sandra Sepulveda? Yes. Wendell Seagroves? Yes. And the motion carries. So what I plan to do at this point is to work with our uh, Homeless Impact Division team to figure out uh, first, how quickly our task force can meet, and then uh, based on that date and time, to set another meeting for uh, the planning council um, so that we can uh, move forward. I, I understand very clearly. Uh, please, if you're not currently talking, please mute yourself. Um, if I understand that there are a lot of feelings around all of this, and, and, and again, as, as I said earlier, I am... I am dismayed, uh, and that's that's the nicest thing that I can say um, about our lack of input into the, all the processes. Um, Don, I have all of the same questions that you've raised, um, and some. So we will work very closely with uh, Judy and, and her team to see if we can get the people on our next uh, meeting call um, that can answer some of these questions for us. Uh, but I know that these are questions that I've actually already been answering I and mean, asking, and I haven't, I haven't really been able to get um, answers for those things. And uh, Brady, it sounds like you and the council have been asking the same kinds of questions and also haven't been able to get those kinds of answers. So maybe we can figure out a way to find someone who can give them to us appropriately. Again, I know that there's a lot of... Go ahead. So I, I do want to acknowledge that we do have uh, Dr. Michael Caldwell um, calling in and just listening here, and also uh, Jay Survey from uh, OEM. Dr. Michael Caldwell is the head of the health department. I, I really appreciate them to take their time out uh, of their health, you know, really busy schedule uh, to listen in. And, yes, uh, I so hear the concerns, and we can actually work with them on uh, with the task force. Hopefully when we reconvene, we will be able to then have some answers. Yes, that would be great. Thank you very much for being a part of this, this call and for listening. Uh, and thank you for what you're doing. I, I know this is, again, I, I may be... Wendell's still upset with his over, hand. Hold on, Wendell. I know that, that uh, we may be a little upset over some processes and things that have happened, but I do want to acknowledge the, the job that, that you all are doing in, in trying to figure out how to uh, move forward in... And again, what is unprecedented times? Wendell, what do you have to say? Comment about the feeding. Uh, my group, Sanctuary yes. Homeless Mel uh, Refuge, we've been there every day. We were there the day of the tornado to help them clean out. We've handed out hundreds of tents of sleeping bags. We hand out propane and hygiene products every day. And we've been feeding between 150 and 200 hot meals every day, seven days a week. Haven't missed a day, nor do we intend to miss a day. Okay, thanks, Wendell. Appreciate it. Um, all right, does anyone else have any other comments? Don, you still have your hand signal up. Do you have anything else you need to say? Uh, yeah, I guess while well, Dr. Caldwell was on, on the phone with us, I just didn't know if it might make sense to get some dates and times when he might be available uh, for a special called meeting where he can attend if we have questions. Um, I, I'm going to leave that to Judy to try to coordinate um, with them. Yeah, I think he, I don't see him right now on there. He may have had to leave, but he was on here for quite a while. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we are to the end of our. Is there anything anyone else needs to bring forward at this? All right, and I'm not seeing anybody's little hand signal waves raised or we're all good then. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. And I make a motion to adjourn. Actually, Wendell, Wendell so moved. Ingrid, would you second? Great, I second. Okay. Um,
And again, we have to do a roll call because that's what we have to do. Abigail, will you roll call? Sure. Okay. Elena Boyer? Yes. April Calvin? Yes. Charlie Strobel? Yes. Don Diener? Yes. Aaron Evans? Yes. Ingrid McIntyre? Yes. Laura Bermudez? Yes. Mark Overlock? Yes. Mary Catherine Rand? Yes. Michelle Hall? Yes. Paula Foster? Yes. Ryan Ellis? Yes. Sandra Sepulveda? Yes. And Wendell Seagross? Yes. All right, with that, the meeting is adjourned. I would ask that any of you have questions that the task force needs to consider, that you would email those to Judy um, so that she can bring those to the task force. And with for your participation and for your commitment to those that we serve. Thank you so much. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.